hear me okay? I know there's a few people online. Can someone give me a thumbs up? Thanks, John. Um, I'm Olivia. I'm a research fellow uh, at the University of Melbourne, and I have a history of digital health research in the mental health space. Um, so I'm really interested and excited about kind of growing collaborations in that area. But here I'm speaking today specifically about the Validatron. Um, and I'm doing that on behalf of um, the leads, really, which is Professor Wendy Chapman and Dr. Kit Huckvale. You're probably familiar with both of those names. So it's a real honour to be here to speak about the Validatron. And I was just saying to the group in the room um, that while I'm hoping you learn about the Validatron, I'm also really here to learn how you as a digital health researcher, as an expert, might use the Validatron, how we could improve the service that we're offering, and particularly how it could be used for the International Centre for Translational Digital Health. We're really interested in how this can be leveraged as a resource from, um, from the Manchester side and from the Toronto side as well. Um, okay. Oh. So um, this is the centre that I'm at, um, the Centre for Digital Transformation of Health. I realise that's a little confusing because the International Centre for Digital Translation of Health has slightly different letters in a different order. Um, but nevertheless, um, this is us at CDTH. And our mission is um, to enable connected healthcare, which doesn't sound that ambitious at all. We're doing lots of work in that space. And that's where the Validatron fits. I just want to start by acknowledging, um, doing an acknowledgement of country. I'm not currently, obviously, on the on Australian land, but I am fortunate enough to work and live on the lands of the Wurundjeri people. Um, they're the traditional custodians of the land. And if you're familiar with Melbourne, that's the yellow area on the map. It's called Melbourne today, but it's known um, by Indigenous folk and, and locally as Woiwurrung. And together, those five lands make up the Kulin Nation. Do you want me to admit? I, I'm, I'm Okay, great. Um, and I just want to pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge that the Validatron and the data we're collecting today is being done on those lands. So I thought I could just talk about the need for the Validatron, which again, I think as digital health researchers, you already are very aware of, but it can then help set up what we're trying to achieve, the mission of the Validatron, and I'll take some time to explain to you what it is and what its components are. And then I thought I could just talk about three neat little case studies that we're doing at the moment, which are digital health projects that are using the Validatron. And I selected them because I think they're leveraging um, different capacity of the Validatron, which is neat to showcase. And then we could talk a little bit about the early learnings, but then also speak, as I said at the start, about some opportunity for collaboration and to really hear your feedback about how we can make this a better service. Um, so when it comes to the need, again, I'm sure you're all aware of this, there are hundreds of thousands of health apps available, lots of different, every single week there's new innovation in terms of digital infrastructure and software and hardware and opportunity and there's tremendous hope and tremendous promise for digital health, I'm sure we're aware of that. But unfortunately, many implemented digital innovations are considered a failure or they struggle at the implementation stage, something falls down. And I, I can say this personally with my own experience in the mental health space, I've had some challenges um, along the way in terms of implementing those. Um, so there's lots of unknowns about how do we translate, even though there's lots of promise and hype. And I wanted to unpack a little bit about why some innovations are falling down um, at the implementation stage, because I think, again, this sets up the capacity and the opportunity that the Validatron and the gap that we're trying to fill. And so to kind of shortcut the answer without going through all these words, it really falls down at that human factor level, or the top six reasons seem to fall down at the human factor level. It's often not at the technology level. And I think um, we're, again, probably all aware of that. So again, just to kind of highlight a few here, um, the number one reason that digital health innovations are falling down is when um, workload is increasing compared with the workflow that existed before. So whether there was a digital tool already in place or not um, is less relevant. It's more about increasing workload. And that makes sense, I think, particularly in the context of COVID. I know our health service in Australia is really facing challenges in terms of workforce after COVID, and I'm sure that's the case here too. Um, another thing that I think is really neat is, or, you know, that sorry is pertinent is that workflow disruption is occurring. So even if workload is not increasing and the digital tool is saving time potentially in the in the task, when there's a disruption in the workflow, that means the work process can can no longer be completed in this linear and smooth manner. Um, and then the other one I wanted to highlight again because it speaks to the experiences that I've had with some of my digital work is when there's undefined or changed roles resulting. So what this means or what can happen is when a digital tool is introduced 
and the responsibility for the new task of the digital tool is not the same um, as it was before or when new tasks are being included in the workflow and no one is assigning responsibilities. Again, this might seem really obvious, but after a year of work and much effort in one of the digital projects I was involved in before I came to the centre, it fell down because we failed um, to assign someone to charge the iPad, which at the core was really the tool. Um, and yeah, so <laughs> I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure you all have your own experiences of similar things, you know, how small those kind of human factors can be when it comes to the challenge. Another way to think about digital innovation, and again, you might be familiar with this image, we use this a lot at the centre, um, is there's a real black box around optimising and implementing and evaluating digital health innovation. And so a nice comparison can be when we think about bringing a new drug treatment to market. There's a very clear established pipeline through which um, new potential therapeutic mechanisms are really extensively tested. And we all know that uh, pipeline very well. And I think what works with that, you know, there's challenges along the way, but what works with that pipeline is that, um, you know, new potential drug targets that should fail do fail and the system is set up for that to happen. So, and we don't really have that for digital health. I know <clears throat> that a lot of work has been done in the last few years in the UK and other places to try to fill that black box. Um, and there's definitely some stuff happening at the latter end around, you know, um, regulatory and kind of legal aspects of it. But um, we still think there's a black box that exists in the middle. And, and that's one of the functions that we hope that Validatron can fill in order to prevent that those challenges that we just talked about from recurring. So that's the need. Um, and this on a page is what the Validatron is. And its goal is to really fill that black box and to reduce the likelihood that, that digital tools will fail. So we're a research platform and our goal is to support the development of digital health products. And we're focusing a lot on implementability, workflow integration and evidence generation, as well as other aspects. Um, what it looks like really is these three pillars and I'm gonna talk about these in more detail, but this is the overview. The first pillar, and I think the most important is really our methods expertise. So this is the people of the Validatron. And we have a team that we've specially recruited who have digital health expertise in things like implementation science from the digital health perspective, evidence generation, again, around digital tools, health technology assessment, of course, co-design, um, human computer interaction and user experience, and then the technical side of the software and um, the hardware that's involved or required. Um, and this, this method expertise, the people of the Elytron are supported by two other elements. So the first is our sim lab, and you've probably you probably have simulation labs or use simulation labs before. Our sim lab is set up specifically for testing um, digital health tools um, in the various healthcare spaces that they might be needed. So it's this very immersive physical space. I'll show you photos in a moment. And on top of doing co-design there and prototyping, it's also about testing and demonstrating those workflow challenges that we know are the barrier often when it comes to digital health tools success. And then the third element, um, which is quite unique and very interesting, I believe we're terming the sandbox and it's really our virtual space. It's the virtual counterpart for that physical space. And here in the sandbox, what we're doing is prototyping, testing and demonstrating um, different types of software, like such as, you know, um, EMR tools and apps and um, kind of rapidly um, accessing and uh, testing the interoperability of the data between those two. And it gives you an opportunity, digital health researchers, an opportunity to test the sorts of things that they might become, uh, you know, unstuck in, in a place where they wouldn't normally. So it's really usually quite tricky to be able to get into a hospital or a primary care setting or another healthcare setting and get access to the software that, that might be needed to make this digital tool work. Um, and the way that it works really is um, someone comes to us with a digital health idea or product, could be from industry, could be from research. Um, so whether it's just at the idea stage or they have a fully fleshed out product. And we think about these three pillars and then work to kind of plug the gap. What does this digital health researcher need from the methods perspective, the sandbox perspective, the sim lab perspective? And all of that is underpinned by um, evidence-backed frameworks and streamlined processes that we're developing at the moment. Um, so that they can be supported to do the steps that they need um, in order to kind of maximize the outcome of this digital health tool. Does that make sense? Great. I'll just show you what it looks like here. So when you come to Melbourne and visit us, which I hope all of you do, this is our co-design space. Um, it's also a multi-purpose space. We have a reception area. Um, this is our primary care setting, our GP setting. Um, we've been told by all of the GPs using it that it's far too clean to be a GP. So we're, we're working on making that more realistic. 
Uh, and this space has been used really extensively by our Department of General Practice at the University of Melbourne, as well as other GPs in the area that are testing lots of different digital tools, like clinical decision um, tools, screening tools, um, patient, uh, patient and um, uh, healthcare provider information, those sorts of things. This is our hospital room. Again, looks far too clean, so we're working on that. Um, and here, this is being used to uh, so this is being used at the moment to test um, primarily how tools can integrate with EMRs that are already in a hospital setting. And this is our uh, primarily our home space. So we're doing a lot of telehealth projects. I'll tell you about those in a moment. So this can be used for telehealth um, in conjunction with our GP space, but it also doubles as an allied care or a therapy room as well. If you're testing a digital tool that might be used in those spaces. And this is the control room um, where you get, um, you know, really fine detailed ability to, um, to for, the, for the researcher to audio visually record what is occurring in the simulated experiences in whatever rooms they might be using to kind of play that back, to give feedback on participants um, and to just really get down to that fine minutia level detail when it comes to the workflow. Um, so this, that's the physical space. This is another way to think about the sandbox. Um, it can be tricky to kind of visualize what it's like, but really it's a virtual environment that you can think of like Lego bricks. So we're combining in the sandbox, both real and simulated uh, infrastructure and a variety of clinical information systems, and they can be fit together, um, you know, much like Lego bricks would. So you've got a prototype app and you want to test how that will go in an EMR and you can do that um, using either a real EMR um, if we have access to it or a simulated and, or, you know, sorry, like a white label. And I think the thing here is that uh, one of the things that it's um, really, that's really valuable is digital health researchers often have to go through kind of extensive development costs working with different development teams in order to get access to this or they have to be able to access the hospital or the physical space. And the sandbox allows you to kind of sidestep that and rapidly prototype and kind of um, rapidly fast fail um, your digital health tool that you might not learn typically until years down the line. Here's an example of what the sandbox can look like. This is us prototyping an app, a remote patient monitoring app where we're measuring various things. Um, here's an example of the, um, the EMR that we have access to that we can see how it fits together. And this is an example of how it kind of can all fit together. So here we're prototyping uh, in a, um, a virtual telehealth consultation, some you know, remote patient monitoring data that's being collected locally by the, voice, you know, by the patient. And then how does that um, get shared with the patient? How do they discuss that information? How do we visualize it? Um, and, and kind of um, understanding all aspects of both the data flow, but also that patient um, provider communication. So that's the Validatron. Does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that? The, um, yeah. the EMR that you've got, is that the one that's used most widely in Australia then? And then you've got some, how did, how did you go about getting that, um, yeah. that simulated? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great question. We have, a, we have both um, and we have some of the EMRs that are used in Australia. We, I don't know if you have this issue here in the UK, but different states are using different- EMRs. Even different hospitals. Yeah, different right? hospitals, yeah. So we have three within Victoria. Yeah, sorry, such a challenge. Um, so Kit's been working really hard on that and can kind of follow up with more details on how we've done that. But yes, that's one of the challenges that the sandbox is kind of overcoming. But yes, we at the moment we have access to both, not 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 comprehensively across all of Australia, um, but we're hoping to increase that as we get more momentum. Um, yeah, I guess I guess just to follow up on that, I guess the question is to what extent you have to use exactly the EMR or EHR that is used by providers or whether you can use something that is a little bit more generic, because otherwise I think you're always going to be facing a, a, a pretty uphill battle, I guess, because you'd have to work with all the, all the vendors, et cetera. That's right, that's right. And I agree, there's a tension between how much you can achieve within the Validatron to kind of, um, to get to get some of the kinks out and then the idea is can we port this and take this into the hospital itself, which it has capacity to do because it can be remote and then really work through. So I think, it's great to think of the Validatron maybe as a staged approach in terms of solving some of the issues early on, but then um, and then supporting that testing in, in the actual healthcare setting. Can I ask a question yeah. about the gap that it's trying to fill? So obviously 
in the UK, we've now got the nice regulatory framework around digital health technologies that they've worked with, with NHRA and others. And sorry, could you got, speak up a little bit? Because oh, I think sorry, otherwise people will yeah. not be able to hear online what we're saying. Yeah, so I, it was really related to the gap that the Village of Toronto is trying to address in terms of those. That's a really nice figure, isn't it? Comparing it to the drug development pipeline. And I was thinking in the UK, Fairly recently, they've updated our NICE framework around approving digital health technologies. Have you got anything that's beginning to emerge like that in Australia? I'm just not aware of yeah. whether that's... Yeah, that's a great question. And one of the things that... So the question yeah, so the question was, the, how do, does Australia operate using the NICE? So um, the team at the Blitatron is really interested and focused on that, and we're doing some work at the moment to learn. I'm, I'm really interested to learn how you guys have used that framework. Is it working well here? Um, is, is it really informing your digital health development right from the start? Um, but that evidence generation and um, frameworks is something that the Validatron is trying to um, understand from what's already working in the rest of the world and then apply in, in terms of the Australian setting. Is that something that's been picked up and used really widely? We're certainly so interested in the use that there's a lot around this around human factors. So we've got particularly on the teaching side, we've, we've really embedded it across the teaching and we're using it as a framework to think about the sort of tiering that they've kind of put the, the, the various technologies into. Um, yeah, I don't know, I've not, certainly I'm not using it. I'm developing an app actually, but we've not got to that point yet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we're in the process of, of picking that up. Um, I mean, there's certainly a lot of attention for it. Um, I wouldn't say it's all already fully integrated in all the research that we do. Yeah, yeah. And I think that makes sense, again, from the digital health perspective. Um, if there's no kind of overall, you know, again, maybe this is one of the things that Litotron can work towards is providing that lighthouse of information around these are the things you need to start thinking of mm -hmm. right from the start. Um, because I do think that it's, some of those frameworks exist, but whether they're getting picked up and used or not and how we, um, you know, increase the uptake of it is a challenge for the field. Yeah. Yeah. I had a question about the sim lab. I mean, I, I, I love the ideas behind the Validatron, uh, all three uh, components of it. Um, but I'm just wondering to what extent it's feasible to really simulate the critical aspects, for instance, of a clinical environment in such a sim lab. So think of you know, the complexity of, of real world clinical environments with the host of different staff, for instance, that are walking around and time pressures and yeah. other things. Yeah. What's your take on that? Yeah, I think, again, um, as a staggered approach, the Validatron has the capacity to test some of that, but that, you know, a really thoroughly tested digital health tool would probably need to take it actually, you know, so that, that's where the implementation science team would step in so that you can take what you've tested in the sim lab into the actual yeah, I agree. I don't think it can solve all of those issues. But I do think about things like how information is presented to patients. In our immersive scenario, we bring in both actor patients as well as real patients and patients with lived experience of whatever the disorder is, um, and real clinicians as well as actor clinicians. And so taking that approach, I think we can um, answer some questions at least in terms of how the tool might be functioning generically, as well as, um, yeah, how information can be fed back and what's going wrong really early on. Um, and, and again, the gap I think that it can feel, taking your point, is that it's really tricky to access those clinical environments often to test the tool, at least in Australia. I'm not sure if that's the case. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. 100%. Yeah. Really, but you get a, really yeah, yeah, so you get a little bit and you get a refined prototype as a result of this, and then, you know, that next stage is in the actual setting. Um, so, so I thought I could just tell you about some case studies that I think are a nice examples of how the Validatron could be used. Um, and, and one of the things I think, I'll just go to the next part. One of the, th one of the things that um, we're working on is helping digital health researchers. And again, I'm wearing my own digital health researcher hat here and saying, I don't, I don't think that we often understand the journey that needs to go on for the tool. Um, we can, you know, I specifically had a lot of understanding of how to evaluate perhaps, but not a lot around the exploration and certainly not around the implementation side. And so what we're doing here is kind of supporting digital health researchers as they come to us with an idea or with a product already to understand all of the kinds of information that they need to be asking and at what stages. I think it's a bit radical, but it's really important that right from the start, we're thinking about things like how will this be commercialized? You know, how will this, what's the feasible payment model for this innovation that needs to be thought about right at ideation. And I'm not sure, you know, certainly from my point of view, I haven't been doing that with my digital health 
research. I haven't been asking the questions that I needed to at the right time. So we see that as our mission. So this is a study um, being done by my colleague, Hassan, um, and he's in our methods expertise team. He's our um, human computer interaction expert. And it's really about optimizing the telehealth waiting room experience. So the problem is, um, you know, um, just, out, you know, this is outside of COVID hours, sorry, the COVID times, the emergency department wait room is approximately two hours and GP visits was around 20 minutes and telehealth consultation was around 20 minutes. And that's about the same now. Um, that were out of COVID. And um, the challenge was, was that patients were, so despite the waiting time being comparable between in-person and telehealth visits, we're finding that the patient experience of telehealth consultation is a lot poorer. Um, and that makes sense. You, they're sitting in front of a black screen. Usually there's no visual cues that the people ahead of you are going in. You don't have a, you know, you kind of feel like you're forgotten about. Um, and, and, you know, that can really negatively affect individuals. And this is a problem, particularly in Australia, as we have, you know, yeah, really large land mass. People often have to travel quite far. And the momentum of virtual care that we had yeah. uh, as a result of COVID, I think, is starting to die off a bit. We're just seeing it return to in-person visits, which is not in of itself a problem, but it's not really dealing with those access issues and the opportunity that virtual care has. Um, so Hassan's working on a project um, to really kind of hone in on these research gaps, again, leveraging the Validatron. So how can we better utilize that waiting time for telehealth to improve the experience? How can we support patients to prepare better for their telehealth session in that time? And how can we think more creatively about patient GP communication in the telehealth context? You have a unique opportunity there, um, which makes it different from face-to-face. -face. So how can we be optimizing that? And so of course, using the Validatron, using the telehealth space, using the GP space, um, he's working, he's been working on interactive and immersive simulations where we bring healthy participants into the lab um, and we have real GPs and there's a number of scenarios that they work through and we can use that to um, better understand what, what could be used within the telehealth um, waiting room time, how types of information can be transferred between um, patient and um, and GP, and then also kind of test whether that communication is being improved as a result of the kind of tools that we're developing. Another kind of similar study that we're working on that I think is really neat is um, understanding how virtual care overall can improve data sharing. So what we're doing here is using remote patient monitoring and body sensor data, again, in a, you know, in a virtual encounter, in a virtual care encounter, um, uh, prototyping an example of where patients can collect data either before their consultation or during their consultation based on advice from their provider, and then um, share that data live with the doctor. And here's an example of what that looks like. And then, uh, you know, the provider and the patient can discuss what those results might mean. Um, and also Kit's interested in thinking about it from the other way around. How can healthcare data from the EMR that's been collected by a clinician be sent back to patients? And just really thinking through how we can more cleverly use data sharing in virtual care settings, both um, synchronously and asynchronously. Another study, um, that I wanted to talk about again, you know, um, I think I've said this a few times, so the challenges for remote and regional health services in Australia are particularly pronounced. I know that's true for Canada as well. I don't totally know if that's the case in the UK. Um, just to give you a sense, um, so this is uh, the state of Victoria. You can see Melbourne on the right there. And the Western Victoria region um, has a number of health services. And, and this area is about one third um, the size of the UK. So a fairly large landmass, but um, we only have about, there's only about 600,000 individuals living in that area. So really large land, this is very common in Australia, a very large land mass, maybe the size of Texas, but um, a very, you know, relatively small population. Um, and the challenge is people are often traveling, you know, 100 kilometers to access the care that they need. So that means that virtual care has, uh, there's a real need in Australia. Um, so another project that's using the Validatron is these health services in this area. They've nominated um, remote patient monitoring as something with real potential, understandably. And what I like about what we're doing here is rather than the other two case studies, we're really taking a zoomed, in those case studies, we were taking in, um, a very zoomed in approach where we're dealing with the minutiae of the workflow and the communication and every single element can be studied and, and optimized. Here, the Lidotron also has the capacity kind of at that macro zoomed out level. So working with all of these diverse, there's up to 12 health services in this region that we're working with, all have very diverse needs and um, challenges. So how can we leverage that to co-design programs across the health services to meet their unique needs, support them to improve their data flow that's being collected, 
um, evaluate and support um, the health services that have current programs in place. And that includes things like, um, you know, we're, we're really taking a lens at the validatron of things like digital readiness of health services at the governance level to implement new virtual care programs, digital and health literacy of the patients involved. Um, and, and we're seeing, I don't know if you see this here, but you, there's a, there can be a lot of kind of pilotitis, is that the right term, where um, innovative health services have pretty cool virtual care programs or remote patient monitoring programs in place, um, but they kind of hit a ceiling when it comes to things like funding or when it comes to translation or sharing those learnings across. So we see that as a goal of the Validatron trip too, you know, how can we take learnings that are already being done well in a health system and kind of come in and support as the research partner for the health system, you know, where there's a lot of um, health service led research, you know, uh, work that's very innovative and implement that across the healthcare system, you know, um, commenting and advising and reviewing the models of care that needed to be wrapped around remote patient monitoring for it to do well. Um, and then to, again, speaking about uh, reimbursement models, which I don't, again, is a challenge in Australia and Canada, and I think might be here as well when it comes to virtual care. And these are all the partners. So, so yeah. So, all right. Um, so we've opened as a research platform. We've had a, we had a soft launch. Um, we haven't had a hard launch yet. Um, and we've, it's just been for three or four months now. And in the first quarter we've supported, oh, you can't, sorry, let me, I think it's 15, sorry. Yeah, we've supported 15 new grant submissions, about $17 million in total um, within the University of Melbourne. Um, and of course, we, on top of that, we also have several ongoing projects. I've given you some case studies. We're working with industry quite a lot as well. Um, and so I think the learning from there is that there is a real need for a platform like this where, where you know, it's interesting to see whether that was just a bunch of people um, who had years worth of research ideas that they needed support with and the, um, the energy will die down as the year goes on. It doesn't seem to be, it seems to be picking up. Um, and and um, and that's been really great to see that, yes, in the medical and sciences area of our university, there's a real need for support. We're learning, and this isn't a criticism at all, this is certainly, I speak as you know, a researcher in this area myself, um, we're learning that when they start embarking on digital health projects, they have very real clinical problems that they've spent a lot of time understanding and they the potential for the digital idea that they're developing is, is real, but they're often very unaware of many factors, including the time and the expense and the methods required. There's a real gap. So, you know, between the clinical problem they want to solve and, and the, the digital health tool that they're thinking of. So we're working to try to improve that. And I think this feeds into our education and workforce area as well. You know, how can we um, develop free digital health project checklists? You know, um, kit likes to kids working on a pamphlet that's like, so you're thinking of making an app, which I really love, you know, just really simple ways that we can support these um, these digital health researchers to think things through, uh, when it, you know, just at the idea stage um, to support them better. So, yeah, I just wanted to summarize and then talk a little bit about the International Center and then I'll finish up. So I think, yeah, again, we all know this, there's tremendous opportunities for um, virtual care, but there's also a great deal of uncertainty about how we design and implement them. And what we're trying to do at the Validatron is focus on the areas we know there are gaps. Our job is, um, is to, you know, we really see that as we're here to help and we're here to plug those gaps. So how can we work closely with researchers to co-design better, create user interfaces that are already going to um, integrate with existing IT systems and, you know, other sorts of aspects that are really um, critical to the success of a digital health project. And we're hoping, we, we like to think that we're offering this kind of concrete pathway or, or maybe not concrete, but a clearer pathway to really reduce that innovation risk tension that's faced, um, that's kind of plaguing the field at the moment. So just think about now International Centre, I'm really interested to hear either now or later on when you've digested this, you know, please follow up with me. As a digital health researcher, could this resource help you? How might this resource help you? I'd be really keen to hear that. Um, is there something that you would like to see the Validatron offer that we're not doing? I'd love to hear that. And then I think just thinking um, more specifically and concretely, how can we develop bilateral and trilateral, you know, thinking of Melbourne, um, Manchester and Toronto, um, that the Validatron can grow our, you know, our current collaborations, but also future collaborations, whether that's through the MMT fund or other sorts of ways. Um, is there an opportunity for you to come and see the physical space of the Validatron? Is there opportunities for you to leverage the methods expertise that we have or to leverage um, the virtual sandbox in some way? I think that would be a really great, a great thing. We want to make it, you know, down the line available to the, 
the researchers here. So I'll just um, kind of yeah finish up with this slide. This is the team. This is Kit, Hassan, Jill, Kara, Debbie, Mahima, the, the methods group, as well as myself. And um, although we're interested in all sorts of digital health methods, these are some of the areas that we're particularly interested in. Um, so one is kind of scenario-based simulations, which you know makes sense um, given given the capacity of the validatron and what we're trying to achieve. But then also you know speaking to your point about evidence standards and evidence generation, Kara is really leading that. Um, we're really passionate about equity aware co-design. Um, that's one of the really core values of the Validatron is um, equity in digital health. I think, again, we're all aware of this, but we're very cognizant that there's the chance that in some instance, you know, digital health should be obviously overcoming um, inequity, but I think there's actually a chance that it can lock people out if it's not used properly. And, and we're really conscious of that in Australia where um, there's equity issues in, in, you know, in various um, populations. Um, digital pathway design and digital readiness assessment, we're really interested in that. Trying to, there's a lot of great digital tools out there, but often the health service or the governance area or wherever it might be, um, you know, there's a gap between their readiness and the tool itself. Um, and then implementation science that particularly has a digital health flavor is obviously so critically important. So that's all I had to say. Thanks for having me. And yeah, really keen to hear from you either now or offline about any of that. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So maybe we should zoom out if you can show us the um, if you start camera. Yeah. And yeah, maybe you can go to the gallery view. You can um, click one. Sorry, one. One. No. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Hello everyone online. So this is actually a hybrid seminar, the first one, uh, all previous seminars. I think, where are we now? Number three or four? I've lost count. I think three. Yeah. yeah. Um, so the previous ones were purely virtual, but this is the, the first one that is hybrid. Um, and thanks so much, Olivia, for a great presentation. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. All of my, I think it's late and, and Melbourne time, so none of my Melbourne colleagues will be online. Yeah. Um, so, so maybe to um, start the discussion, so I, th I think we should definitely try to see how we can use the Validatron for work that's being done here and in Toronto. Um, I guess, yeah, a, a question that I have is, what would you say is required well, maybe twofold. So first of all, what would be an ideal type of project where we consider that? Secondly, what would be required both from our side and your side to make that happen? Because I'm conscious that it, we can only do it, I guess, if there is, if there are resources uh, available both here, assuming that we do it here, and in Melbourne to make it happen. Yeah. But the question is a little bit, you know, so how much roughly would we need? And then the next question would be obviously for us to think about how do we make that happen? How do we find that resource? Yeah. So I think one, you know, um, one thing that would be great is understanding how both of the universities, um, so Manchester and Toronto, are are filling this gap themselves. You know, they don't, they might not have the Validatron or maybe they have something similar or comparable, but in general, do you have a sort of system-wide approach to yeah, evaluating, optimizing, prototyping, or is that tend to be done within each project? And I think, yeah, learning about how that is occurring um, is one great way that we're kind of, you know, sharing ideas and there's consistency across the board. Um, so happy if anyone, if you want to speak to that more generally, like how does Manchester do that now, I guess is something I'm interested in learning. And then another thing I think that's, um, you know, a, a really, uh, that really stands out is, um, how can tools that have been shown to be effective in one setting apply or translate into another setting? I think um, there's a lot of isolation that occurs in digital health tools, and yet there's so many great things being done in the UK. There's so many great things being done in Canada. And rather than reinventing the wheel, which I think it is, we're a lot, we're, we're doing that a lot. It would be great to take the learnings and the tools that have been developed in one country and see if we can apply that. Um, and I think that could go both ways. So, you know, the Validatron could work to translate yeah, tools and 
across the board. And then I think I think another point to speaking to equity is really understanding how we're all probably taking different approaches to challenge, challenges around equity. Um, but I think there's a chance there to work more collaboratively and cohesively and, again, kind of share learning. So they're the kind of three things that come to mind just based on, um, yeah, where the Bulletron is focused in our early days. Yeah, I can I can uh, give a brief response to your first question. Um, and, you know, it's actually great to see, you know, how, how similar uh, the things are that you are going, trying to achieve in Melbourne to what we're trying to achieve with the Pankers Institute. Um, there's great. lots and lots of similarities. Oh, I'm so pleased to see you hear that. Yeah, yeah, it's really striking. Um, although I do think some of the solutions that we're developing are slightly different, but that's fine, that, that's nice. And so there's some complementarity there. So one of the things that we're working on is called the Translational Roadmap. <laughs> Sorry. Lovely. Um, so that's um, led by our translation lead, Claudia Lindner. And it's basically um, a, an interactive document, so it's going to be online, that tells you for three different types of innovations. So we've got non-invasive medical devices, invasive medical devices, and software as a medical device. Lovely. Tells you at each um, level of maturity, so each um, technology readiness level, mm -hmm. what is it that you need to address um, or start addressing to make sure that your um, invention, your technology will actually translate further downstream. So, and you've already mentioned some of the things that are very similar. So for instance, quite early on, we say to people, start thinking about you know, how this would be commercialized. Yeah. What would that look like? And indeed, who would pay for it? You know, who's, who's the, um, the, 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 the organization or group of people that would eventually pay for the product once it becomes a product? Now, you might still be, you know, quite far away from that stage where it's, your, your technology is going to be um, made into a product. But... Um, we do say to people, you have to start thinking about those things early. Mm -hmm. And at those initial stages, it might be quite sketchy, which is fine. And then later on, you fill in further details. But not thinking about it at all is really not a good idea. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've been there. I think, yeah, and I think that's great. And so I'd be really great. To, it'd be great to connect and, and hear more about that. And one thing, you know, one thing that comes to mind is how some of those things will be specific to the UK, but much of it will be probably translatable across yeah. context. And we have this very big pipeline of researchers coming to us who need to ask these questions. So I'm not sure if, um, you know, Manchester has kind of a centralised access where all of your digital health researchers are coming with these questions, but that's something also we could consider is, is you know, putting our pipeline of researchers through this tool that you're developing. Um, yeah, you know, that'd be great. Yeah, essentially what the roadmap is going to do is, is, is point people towards resources that exist both here in Manchester as... Uh, elsewhere, both nationally and internationally, to address those those questions. Right. Um, so it might be once it's finished. So it's going to be published later this year. Currently, the website is in development. But once that's happened, it might be worth looking at it together. Yeah, great. And probably, you know, it it's it, it needs some adaptation to be applicable in Melbourne and in Toronto, but not, I think you know, the general structure will still be the same. Yeah, great. And a lot of it will still be applicable, but there's some specific things perhaps that are very specific to the UK for instance, that you want to change. Yeah, yeah great. I think those adaptation project, project, projects are a really nice idea, whether the tool, wherever the tool exists, how can we adapt yeah, lessons and learnings and tools for digital health researchers to a different context? Yeah. I've got more questions and comments actually, but I'm going to shut up for a while because I, I, I know there's other people in this room as well and people online. I don't know whether there's anyone online who would like to ask a question. Anyone here? I had, I had a couple more. So I was quite interested around certainly that pre digital health project checklist. So that sounds really interesting to me and where that's up to. And I'm thinking with my capacity building hat on, actually, if we could, if there's something that's going to be really soon that we could signpost or I don't know if you, you guys are going to publish that, that might be really helpful. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I was, so that was one question. And the other question was, 
I was just wondering, you, you, you noted quite a number of industry collaborators there. I just wondered if you could comment on how the just part of the power of I see what you've got there is you could bring in those industry collaborators too. And I imagine you know, they're not going to have access to this kind of space, just like us as researchers won't either. So just how that's beginning to kind of shape up. Yeah, um, yeah. so I think it'd be lovely to collaborate on a pre-digital health checklist. I think that'd be a really nice output that we could kind of co-do. We've got drafts of what it looks like, but, um, yeah, really keen to... So we could, so I think, you know, the team are thinking it through from the research perspective, but how we translate in that something that's usable from, like, an education perspective, that would be a lovely thing to work on together. Um, and, yes, the industry side of... So I'm, a, I'm on the research side of things. The industry side of things has been very busy and very successful. And there's been a lot of demand from industry. Um, we're working with a few multinational European companies, US companies, as well as Australian companies who are interested in yeah, using particularly the sandbox to test and to translate different tools into different contexts. Um, that's being led um, by other you know, individuals on the other side of the Politron. I think the key thing that we're hoping to aim for, at the moment they're operating a little bit in silo, so you know, academic researchers and industry are sort of not really mixing, which makes sense. I think one thing we're keen to do down the line as the Validatron evolves is get better at integrating those two things um, so that researchers can access tools and vice versa. Um, there's a lot in that space. Uh, the main one, I think, in my view, just personally, is... Um, is the industry's tolerance for what constitutes evidence and that there's a gap sometimes, I think, between that and academics. Um, but that's okay. There's challenges that can be overcome. But, yes, I think we're putting 11 industry projects through since we've opened, which has been really, um, really exciting. We weren't totally sure how industry would take it. And, yeah, they've been really receptive mm -hmm. because they have these tools and there's all this investment, but then they just haven't. The biggest reason is they just cannot get into health. It's hard enough for us to get into healthcare mm -hmm. services. For them, it's just basically impossible. And so the Validatron is, again, that staggered stepping stone, which gives them more capacity to connect. Yeah. Yeah. I guess it's a, you know, um, indication that you're doing the right thing. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, it's interesting to see how we go. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, next quarter and the quarter after, whether it just everybody was in the woodworks for a few years. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and is the role of industry purely then to use the Validatron to test their new products, or do you also partner with them where they potentially, for instance, further develop? Um, part of the Validatron, especially the sandbox. Yeah, um, yes. yeah, yeah, it's that. Um, so we're, um, we're we're testing that out now. What does the what um, what is the model that looks like partnership with? So not just them using our space, but what is the uh, part, uh, the pathway for us to kind of collaborate and work together and have outputs, whether that's research related outputs or digital innovations. We're sort of testing that at the moment, um, which has been fun. Um, I've learned a lot about industry, which I didn't know anything about. You know, I think I was fit in my ivory tower of academia, which is, yeah, you're not able to do, I think, in the digital health space. Yeah, learning a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any other questions? There's a question from Jason in the chat. How do you assess the potential literature of your suppliers? Yeah, that's such a great question, Jason. Uh, this is, um, we're, we're working on this right at this moment. Um, we're coming up with um, systems and processes where we're essentially doing like a mini peer review of the things that come through to us at the research and on the industry side against um, criteria that we think relate to success and feasibility. So it's things like um, all sorts of things we're considering. So these aren't set in stone yet, but things like is this incremental transformation of health or is this really transformational? Is, you know, what is the feasibility of the clinical problem that we're trying to solve? What's the feasibility of the tool? Um, is a developer required for this? Um, yeah, what's the commercialization potential? You know, um, and yeah, so so as they're coming about and, and you know, down the line, hopefully we can publish them. Again, looking to hear back on any experiences folk have had around how we decide um, how we decide what is a good project and whatnot. We have kind of have to operate, I guess, as a grant reviewing board in a sense. So, yeah. Yeah. At the moment, we're not saying no to anyone. We're um, really looking to support and collaborate um, 
but as time goes on, we'll refine what are the things that we're giving to people to say that they're not ready quite yet. And these are some of the things like, um, in, you know, education and workforce tools and uh, uh, materials that they can work through to improve their idea versus, okay, we're ready to partner now. Yeah. One thing we've been thinking about with the centre is what might be the role of patients and lay representatives, carers, et cetera, in the centre and, and this kind of partnership between industry and researchers and patients. I just wondered if you could comment on what, you know, you said you think you had patient actors, but also real patients, what they've, what their experience has been in terms of getting involved in the literature. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. So. Um, so we're trying a few different models at the moment. Um, we've tried, you know, we tried sort of more like a, an advisory board role for patients speaking to the research projects and then also them being included as um, actual participants in the study. Um, uh, the actor scenarios in general are, are used based on instances where we think we don't kind of have, you know, the, the idea is still developing and it's kind of not ready to go to patients yet. Um, but yeah, we've had really good engagement from patients around um, a whole variety of projects. Yeah, mental health focused projects, as well as um, sexual health screening projects, as well as, you know, a, a variety of sorts of issues. And I do think they give a really kind of rich level of feedback on how the information that's being presented to them um, is being interpreted. Um, particularly around things, for example, like risk screen, you know, when, it, when the tool might be doing risk screening and giving kind of, you know, difficult information there. We're starting to get a little bit more into the pediatric population, which is really interesting as well. Like um, how can digital tools be used in pediatric patient populations and testing that? Um, but I think it is a really good important point. How do you meaningfully involve patients in the international center? And, and is that done on an individual project by project basis with sort of values, or is that done at this more kind of governance level? Mm -hmm. I think it's important that it's represented in both ways so that, uh, that, that patients with lived experience of whatever that might be. Uh, so we, we've got some involvement, sorry, from patients who've had really poor experiences with the healthcare system. And so letting them help inform our work has been really, really valuable. And so, yeah, I do think, um, yeah, kind of meaningful involvement. It does have to be potentially at that co-governance level. I'm not sure if that's something on the table for the International Centre, but it's certainly been very valuable. Right. Well, Olivia, thanks again. Thank you. Great talk. Thank you. And I'm sure we'll continue discussions yeah, over the next couple of start. days while you're here. Start. Yeah, 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 great. Uh, thank you, people, for joining online and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Can I